Hello and welcome to today's lesson where we're going to look at the life cycle of average stars which is found in the space physics topic in GCSE separate science physics. So in today's lesson we're going to look at the uh, life cycle of an average star. So, uh, if we learn and are successful in today's lesson, we can describe what a star is. We can detail how the average star evolves over its lifetime, and we can explain why a star evolves in its lifetime. So this links into the following part of the GCSE Separate Science Physics Specification. 4.8.1.1, our solar system and then 4.8.1.2, the life cycle of a star. Now we can show the life cycle of a star as a flow chart from stage to stage. Now there is a famous diagram which charts a star life through its size and its color, which is called the hersprung russell diagram. So we can plot this life cycle of a star with a diagram. Now two physicists, Hertzsprung and Russell worked independently on this diagram and they published their results within days of each other in 1913, so both were given credit regarding this diagram. So, a star starts its life here on the hertzsprung russell diagram, and in its life the star travels along the main sequence of the hertzsprung russell diagram, before it then goes up into the giant stage, and then comes back down into the dwarf stage, where the star ends its life here. So this path the star plots out throughout its existence is called the life cycle. So we can show this life cycle as a simplified flowchart in three main parts. So in the main, the main sections to the life cycle of a star include the birth of a star, the main sequence of a star, and the death of a star. Now the birth of a star is the time in the star's life cycle before it carries out nuclear fusion. The main sequence is the time in the star's life cycle when it carries out the nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium, whilst the death of a star is the time in the star's life cycle when it carries out the nuclear fusion of heavier elements and beyond. So let's have a look at this life cycle of an average star when we look from stage to stage. Now we know from work in previous lessons that the sun is currently at the main sequence section of its cycle. Now the main sequence is the major part of a star's life cycle. Now the main sequence is denoted by the fusion of hydrogen nuclei into helium nuclei in the core of a star. But the star doesn't start its life cycle in the main sequence. The sun and all other stars began life as a gas and dust cloud in a nebula. Now hydrogen can be found in areas of deep space after the Big Bang. So remember that hydrogen nuclei or protons were produced in the Big Bang and a collection of hydrogen gas in the universe is called a nebulae. Now the original name for a nebulae was a planetary nebulae as we thought this is where planets formed in our galaxy. Now this was wrong but the name stuck so just remember there are no planets in a planetary nebula. Now a nebula is a very cold region of space so this means the gas molecules inside the nebula move very very slowly. So here's an example of a nebula found in the Milky Way galaxy. So we start off the life cycle of an average star with a planetary nebula. Now gravity can then cause the formation of a protostar from the nebula. So this heats up the particles in the star and eventually nuclear fusion begins, the star switches on and produces energy. So gravity forces the hydrogen gas to form a sphere, which we call a protostar. As the particles are moving so slowly, the gravitational attraction takes over and pushes the particles together to form a sphere. So this is called a protostar. Now the temperature is increasing inside a protostar, however it is still too cold to carry out nuclear fusion. Now gravity forces the hydrogen into a sphere as this is the most stable shape in the universe. The protostar becomes denser as gravitational forces continue to pull it together. So this makes the particles in the protostar collide more often. So more energy from the gravitational potential energy store of the particles is transferred to the thermal energy store. So what happens is the temperature of the protostar increases. So here's an artist's impression of what a protostar would look like. So, you've got now on your life cycle of an average star, the first stage, the planetary nebula, the second stage, the protostar, and the third stage, the main sequence, because eventually the temperature and pressure of a protostar increases so much that fusion begins. So at this point, the protostar becomes a star. So when the temperature is high enough, the hydrogen nuclei fuse together to form helium nuclei. So again, here's an artist's impression of a protostar turning into a main sequence star. 
So, when a star carries out mainly hydrogen fusion, we say it is on the main sequence. Now, a star will spend the majority of its life in the main sequence. Now, during the main sequence, hydrogen is fusing together to form helium. So, when this happens, the mass before is greater than the mass afterwards. So, the mass of the hydrogen nuclei is greater than the mass of the helium nucleus. Now, the reason this takes place is because some of the mass of the hydrogen turns into energy in the fusion process, and this energy is is released as electromagnetic waves or radiation from the star. So it's an important idea as to why the star will release energy. And this principle which describes this is E equals mc squared. The change in mass times by c squared is equal to the energy released by a star. Now on a star, there are always two forces which act upon it. You've got the gravitational attraction produced by the mass of the particles in the star, and this acts inwards. You've then got the fusion pressure produced by by the products of fusion escaping the star. This acts outwards. So remember, in the main sequence, the fusion pressure is equal to the gravitational attraction. So our gravitational attraction inwards is equal to our fusion pressure outwards. So because they are the same size, this means there's no overall force in the star. Now, if there's no overall resultant force in the star, the star will remain stable in its main sequence. So this actually is also important because it shows that the greater the gravitational gravitational attraction in the star so the larger the star, the greater the fusion pressure to gain equilibrium for them to equal each other. So what this means is larger stars have to have a greater rate of fusion compared to smaller stars. So what this means is when we look through these particular ideas, larger stars spend less time on the main sequence than smaller stars as they have a greater rate of fusion compared to smaller stars. Now, as the sun is a relatively small star, it will spend a very long time on the main sequence compared to other stars because its fusion pressure is not very large because its gravitational attraction is not very large. So remember, in the main sequence, the fusion pressure outwards equals the gravitational attraction inwards. So now we've looked at the first three stages of our average star. Let's now look at stage four. When the hydrogen starts to run out and the helium has the, is then left as the main fuel source, the helium then begins to fuse inside the core of the star. This causes the star to expand into a red giant and in red giants the fusion of elements larger than hydrogen takes place. So what happens is this will increase the fusion pressure outwards as larger fragments are being pushed outwards when fusion takes place because remember we'll have a fusion of elements larger than hydrogen. So because now our fusion pressure is larger, this has caused the star to increase in size and become a red giant. But just remember, the temperature of a red giant is lower than a main sequence star, as even though it's producing a greater amount of energy via nuclear fusion, there's a greater area to the star, so the energy is more spread out. Now, however, more energy is needed to fuse larger elements together, as there's a greater repulsion between them. This is because larger elements have more protons so therefore more positive charge. So again this is indicated because the energy in a star is shown by the temperature of the star. Now average stars like the sun only have enough temperature, enough energy to fuse up to carbon. Beyond that there's not enough energy to fuse elements larger than carbon in average stars because they're not hot enough. They don't have enough energy to overcome the repulsion between the really big nuclei and force them together to carry out fusion. Now, let's just clarify our idea of what a red giant star is. So in a red giant star, the star has run out of hydrogen and is now mostly helium. So at this point, the helium and helium start combining and cause the red giant stage. So the star expands as, the, as now the fusion pressure is greater due to heavier nuclei fusing. So the fusion pressure is now bigger than the gravitational attraction. So there's a resultant force outwards and this causes expansion. So in our red giant, the outer atmosphere is now inflated and the radius is now immense and the surface temperature is now low. So even though more energy is being given off in the main sequence star, the amount of energy per surface area is smaller, so the red giant is cooler. And you can observe this by looking at the difference in size of the sun as a main sequence star to what we think the sun will be like as a red giant. So, fusing together bigger and bigger nuclei with greater positive charge requires more and more energies, so greater temperature and greater pressure. Now, average stars like the Sun only have enough 
temperature and pressure to cause nuclei up to the size of carbon to fuse. So once it reaches this point, fusion stops in the star, the outer layer is shed to form a new nebula, and the core of carbon is left to cool as a white dwarf. So when we think the sun is going to go as a red giant, the Earth and the inner planets will be destroyed, and the sun will serve to this for about 100,000 years before eventually, like we said, fusion stops as the temperature and pressure are not high enough for further fusion to take place, the outer layers drift off and a white dwarf is formed. So the outer layers of the star are released to form a new nebulae to start the cycle again, which is why we call this process a stellar life cycle. A new nebula starts off the process again and again. Now the core of carbon is left behind, which is what we call a white dwarf. Now if we think about it, um, carbon under immense pressure will turn into diamond. So you can consider a white dwarf to be a core of diamond. Now the white dwarf is no longer carrying out fusion, rather it's emitting light as an afterglow of the fusion process. So you can think the, of the white dwarf as like the hot embers after the fire. This dwarf will cool down for a long time as energy is lost to space. So here's an observation of a white dwarf star. The outer layers of our red giant have drifted off to leave our white dwarf star star left behind. So let's remember the red giant star collapses to form a very hot white dwarf star but a planetary nebula of gas and dust is also formed and the white dwarf burns for millions of years before going out. So we can think about this idea of the white dwarf as like a massive diamond in the sky because it is carbon under immense pressure left to cool for the remainder of time. So what happens after the white dwarf stage? Well eventually the white dwarf cools down until it forms a black dwarf. So this happens because the energy is lost to space. Now interestingly to note, black dwarfs have never been observed in our universe. Black dwarfs are purely theoretical objects. Now black dwarfs in theory are in thermal equilibrium with space, they're at the same temperature as space, so this means they are very very cold. Now we, we do not think we've ever observed a black dwarf in the universe because black dwarfs are very small, they, they're very dim and they exert little gravity so they can't be easily observed and in addition to this the universe has not existed for enough time for a black dwarf to cool from a white dwarf so as a result the universe has just not been around long enough so at the end of its life cycle with its nuclear fuel exhausted a dull black star will form. Now currently no black dwarfs have ever been observed due to the fact they emit no light so they're difficult to detect and also they take a long time to form so we think none have formed yet. So here we've got our life cycle of our average star. Now let's have a look at each step. The first step, the planetary nebula. So you've got cold molecular gas consisting of hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang. You then got the second step, the protostar. The molecules of hydrogen and helium begin to clump together under gravity, heating the molecules up. You then got the third stage, the main sequence, when the hydrogen nuclei are fused to form a helium nucleus, releasing large amounts of energy. You then got the red giant stage, when helium nuclei are fused to generate energy, the star expands, it changes colour and it cools down. You then got the white dwarf stage, which is when the hot carbon core is left cooling in space after other gases are released to form a planetary nebula and finally the sixth stage the black dwarf stage which is a theoretical object thought to exist once a white dwarf has cooled down. So what have we learned in today's lesson? That the sun was formed from a cloud of dust and gas, which is a nebula, pulled together by gravitational attraction. And you should be able to explain how at the start of a star's life cycle, the dust and gas are drawn together by gravity causing fusion reactions. And that fusion reactions lead to an equilibrium between the gravitational collapse of a star and the expansion of a star due to fusion energy. Now you should also be aware that a star goes through a life cycle and the life cycle is determined by that of the star. Star. And you should be able to describe the life cycle of a star the size of the sun, an average size star. So what do we know takes place? We know that we start off with a cloud of gas and dust and nebula. That leads then to a protostar, a main sequence star, a red giant star, a white dwarf star, and then a black dwarf star. So if we've been successful and learnt in today's lesson, we should be able to describe what a star is, detail how the average star evolves over its lifetime, and finally explain why a star evolves in its lifetime. So hope you've enjoyed today's lesson on the life cycle of average stars, which is part of the space physics topic in GCSE Separate Science Physics. Thank you very much for watching, and as always, have a lovely day.